Hi everyone. Welcome to our webinar today, which will be covering successful strategies for industrial digitization. We have a very interesting agenda today, which you can see here. First, we will go through a general overview of today's topics, as well as look at key challenges when going through a digitalization process. We will then have a look at information modeling and OPC UA and how this can help fuel digital transformation. Equinor will then present their experiences with OPC UA based information modeling, followed by Startcraft, who will then talk about RDS and information modeling within power generation. After this, we will move on to talk about how contextualization of data is important for applications. Uh, so Petter Graf at Northscaler will talk about the value of using open source technology. Predictor will follow up with some specifics on how OPC UA based information modeling can be used to successfully implement open source technology. And then finally, Steve Eitken at Intelligent Plant will present their app store for industry and how contextualized data makes it easier to impl implement their applications. To do this, we have a great set of presenters to you. First up will be Espen Krog. He is the CEO and former CTO of Predictor. He has a master's in technical cybernetics from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology and has been a champion of interoperability and OPC and later OPC UA technology for over two decades now. Followed by Stefan Sørenes, he is a leading advisor plant industrial IT at Equinor. Stefan's focus is on setting a direction and vision for making operational data and information from the physical world available in the IT platform in a secure and interoperable way through data capture, contextualization and distribution across the value chain. Following that, we have Erik Viborg. He is a member of numerous standardization groups, notably IEC TC57 and ISO TC10. He has a PhD in mechanical engineering from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology and has been working with hydro turbines at Startcraft since 2006. Following this, we will have Petter Graf. He is a serial entrepreneur with extensive experience consulting and teaching for large companies such as PayPal, Google and NASA. He is also a frequent lecturer at US universities. He is originally from Norway, but has spent his last 30 years in the US. And Petter is currently the co-founder and CTO for Northscaler. Following this, we have Magnus Bakken. He is a senior research scientist and PhD student at Predictor, has a background in cognitive science, natural language processing and software engineering, and is currently focused on how to create further value from contextualized data. Finally, we have Steve Eitken. He runs Intelligent Plant, a disruptive high growth technology business which is currently branching out of Aberdeen. He is passionate about the possibilities in data analytics for clients who truly own their data and encourages partnerships and collaboration where possible, centered around the industrial app store as a delivery model. Finally, some practical information about this webinar. If you have any questions to any of the presenters, please use the Q&A feature to write down these. There is a short Q&A session after each presentation where I will bring up any questions that have been received. But since we have a tight schedule and to avoid missing any questions, please just send us your questions during the presentations and I will collect them and get them answered during the Q&A. Please also note, note that this webinar is recorded and we will look at making this available after the event. OK, that's it for the introduction. Then I would like to invite the first presenter, Espen Krog, to uh, show his presentation. Thank you, Robin. 
And then I believe I'm live with my presentation. Can you just confirm a little bit? Yep. Good. So I'm going to talk about um, uh, a little, a little around the digitization industries and, and why it's so difficult. And by touching upon that, also then come into and announce the topics of the day. Uh, so um, just imagine uh, if you have a talent of implementing or like to implement uh, predictive maintenance within your big asset uh, portfolio in a heavy is industry. Imagine if that was as easy as installing an app on a smartphone. So let's call this the iPhone moment of heavy asset industries. Just to, to, to dig a little bit into that idea, um, I guess I show this, which you all should be familiar with, where we have smartphones and then we have various apps we can download to the smartphone. There are developers that can provide um, their innovations uh, through an app store to us. So they publish the apps and we install them, download and use them. And uh, in between here, often there's a moderator. This is uh, the App Store owner that assures that it's high quality on all apps coming into the store. Uh, but also they set up the commercial arrangements between the consumers of the apps and the providers of the apps. Um, so if you look at the core setup of this and how this actually works, um, uh, on the on the user side, we have a user with various types of uh, smartphones from various suppliers. So it's different hardware with different types of sensors, etc. This is, however, standardized by them all using the same operating system and then using the same APIs for exposing the data. So this means that the developer can address a standard in terms of both the infrastructure on operating systems and hosting the app, but also the meaning of the information. Uh, so when they create one app, it can be rolled up to a lot of different hardware types, et cetera, et cetera. And the user is there and he is very uh, concerned about being in control of the information being provided through the APIs to the apps. So, so that's some, a key element for him to authorize the usage of the sensor data to the apps. So all in all, the concept is uh, hardware or assets with big variation in the owned assets. We have a way of exposing sensor data, light streams, and then we have the plug and play effect with this, with the app supplier. And we have a user that wants to be in control. Now, if we look at the industries, heavy asset industries, and the future for those. Could it be that we could end up with a similar concept for deploying apps across a high variation of, of owned assets? So we switch out uh, the user with an asset owner in industrial assets. Um, and then if this was the situation, what are the core challenges and actually seeing that this could happen? First, there is the problem number one. There's an extreme variation in assets and sensors, very much higher than the variation you see in today's smartphones. So that's of course a core problem. Um, then we have uh, the challenge with um, existing investments in what I call the Industry 3.0. We have the automation pyramid or the Purdue model, that is also called, that has worked well for many years, uh, but the the information that the apps would like to, to get hold of is somewhere in this pyramid. It could be in several layers or in one or two layers, but often none of these layers are kind of like standardized with industry to have a standardized hookup. Uh, so, so this means whatever app that will be deployed to this information pyramid needs significant integration work in order to be up and running. And then the last challenge with this is that uh, even more critical than for us as users of a smartphone, it's even more critical to be in control of the data being exposed to apps for the asset owner. It needs to rely that it's securely uh, handled with the application and that the core activity in the 
automation pyramid is not hampered by deploying an app. So there's a lot of problems that needs to be solved in order to see this happen for the industries. But something is 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 happening now, and it has um, a lot of different organizations have looked into this challenge for quite some years now, and we do see things appear on the horizon. So we have uh, the asset owner. He's he's quite happy with his automation pyramid. It does the, the core necessary, necessary work of actually doing the basic automation and operation of the assets. Uh, but the challenge is still there that the, the developer don't see uh, the standardized uh, infrastructure that it can plug his app into in order to get it to work. So still significant efforts needs to be done. So then we introduced the idea of a new architecture, uh, more specifically, uh, Namur Open Architecture. So the idea here is that the data from the existing setup of technologies within uh, the industry can be exposed through a new layer. And uh, the exposure through this layer is secure, so only the, uh, the data that uh, is consciously uh, exposed to this will be exposed and uh, especially the data going coming as input back to the pyramid will be controlled. But on the other side of this uh, layer is open standards, both in terms of protocol and in terms of information models and understanding the data. So the uh, Namu open architecture is uh, coming from an organization called NAMU, of course. This is a user association uh, or automation technology uh, in process industries. It was established quite a few years ago in 1949, more than 150 members. And the members are all uh, end users, uh, the biggest players in heavy asset industries. And this organization then publishes recommendations and worksheets for automation and digitization for their members. And then this NOAA uh, concept is then a set of such worksheets. So there are five now in the planning, two or three are already released, and they are soon coming the, the rest of them, the ones. So NOAA will make production data easily and securely available um, for new uh, applications for monitoring and optimization. It opens the automation pyramid and unlocks the data. OPC UA is selected as the protocol here, and within this uh, recommendation is an information model with standardized semantics. So, themes for, for the day will uh, we'll, uh, follow up and explore more on the key challenges that we identified with the setup of and targets on an iPhone moment for heavy asset industries about standards not adopted or being available, about extreme variation, about digital information being exposed by a legacy infrastructure. So with respect to standards, uh, and uh, there are different ways of, of crafting standards. So one important way of crafting standards is through extreme adoption. So that, this has happened uh, historically many times. We have uh, we have terms like Xerox. So the copier machine, the, the pioneer there, made a standard uh, of this by being the first one, etc. You can see many of those. So the adoption of one specific type of technology will uh, create a de facto standard by itself. And in our world, in software, this has now uh, come very strong late uh, the last 10 years through the open source initiatives. So Peter will talk a lot about that. I will, in the next uh, session, dig a bit deeper into the, uh, the theme of RPC UA and information models. And then we know that Eric will talk about uh, RDS and the ways you can classify data to get some more order into uh, the existing structures we see in on the equipment side of industries. And uh, Stefan will uh, tell about their choices uh, in uh, digital architectures and what they're working on with Econor. 
Um, we will see uh, Steve presenting his intelligent plant and app store and some examples on plug and play setups with specific technologies towards the standards we're talking about. And that more or less concludes my first session. I'm a bit early, Robin, but I think that's good because um, I think I need a bit more time to the next one. The first Q and A's for this first session. Yes. yes. Let's see. We do have one question for you. What's the difference between Namur and OPC Foundation? Yeah, so um, that's a good question. There are, there are both organizations um, uh, open uh, for figuring out all, all standards for, for industrial, the, the industries. But uh, the Namur organization is only open for end clients and end users, meaning uh, uh, the plant owners, whereas OPC Foundation has a lot of membership and maybe most members from the supplier organizations. Uh, what's interesting, though, is that these organizations are now putting their heads together and figuring out what is the specific um, standard to set up for various purposes in the industries. So I would say one is more dominated by suppliers, the other one is more dominated by end users. I don't hear you, Robin. Sorry. Uh, please, con please continue with your next presentation, Espen. No further questions. Okay. Should we have like uh, a few minutes break just to pick up a coffee cup for the next session? Yeah. If you if you have time, then we can uh, put a couple of minutes. So at twelve twenty, we will continue from Espen. Before we continue, Espen, we have one more question for you from the last one. Uh, are OPC UA and Namur competing standards or is Namur a companion spec to OPC UA? I would say the, the latter is more, more the thing. Namur is, uh, is an organization more identifying existing standards, the way of doing things and putting those together for the, the use organization as the members. So more in, in this situation, Namur has chosen OPC UA to be the protocol, uh, but then they are working on a specific uh, information model uh, that they would like to be hosted by this protocol. And uh, so this will most likely, as I expect, come out as a companion specification to OPC UA. OK, thank you. That was it. Please continue. OK. Then we continue the presentation. So the next session for me is about this concept of information models and what that has to do with OPC UA. So we're talking about heavy, heavy industries and there are massive volumes of real-time asset data. In, uh, in many enterprises, there are like uh, some hundred thousand data points in one single asset, up to many million data points in, across the enterprise. And, uh, and these data is a bit different than traditional IT data. It's OT or operational technology data, meaning that originates from sensors and field buses and PLCs. And, and then they have somewhat different nature than IT in general. Uh, because they are real-time data, and this means there are data streams with transient information uh, and that has latency limits. So you must capture and look into the data before it, it disappears uh, if you have to act upon those. Now, in, in many industries, these data points will typically be represented by a system in that pyramid, in the automation pyramid. Uh, and in oil and gas, they call this an information management system. And then when you, when you set up different applications across the enterprise, many of those applications need to tap into those data streams in order to do their thing. 
Um, for instance, we have enterprise resource planning. They need to tap into the data and understand what is happening in, in uh, the plants. You have the asset management type of systems uh, that need to uh, dig into the same data streams or many of the same. And for instance, integrated operations. Just an example of three different typical functions deployed across an enterprise in, in industries. Uh, the challenge is though that these arrows that we look upon here is quite challenging to get in place and that's what we call data plumbing. I will now address this specific challenge in more detail. So an app consuming the operational technology data uh, often needs to uh, get read time interoperability in place, meaning it needs to consume the data as they appear from the asset. Uh, so now we take a look at the real life example on how this is actually done in an industrial project. An example in this case is this beautiful site. This is um, halfway up in Norway, in the middle of Norway on the coastline, and it's um, Ormen Lange. Lange is a, an offshore uh, gas reservoir where uh, um, oil and gas companies has uh, put a lot of installations on the seabed and there are a lot of uh, wells uh, down there to the gas reservoir and the, and the gas is brought into land before being cleansed and exported to England. With this asset, there's a lot of challenges with the long pipelines. You could have sub-zero temperatures, etc., and there's a rough seabed, meaning liquids are accumulating in bumps and then suddenly shooting into the, to the asset and equipment when the pressure builds up. So there's a lot of challenges. Uh, it's of critical importance that the operators of this asset is aware of the state of the subsea pipelines. Hence, they have invested in what they call the flow assurance system. And the key purpose of this system is to be give um, updated information of the complete subsea process at all times. Uh, so a flow assurance system is being installed towards this asset and the asset then has a key uh, automation system called SAS and then an information management system on top of this one that mediates the information from the SAS to the other systems. All in all, for, for this specific project, 3,600 real-time data points um, needed to be captured and, and channeled into the flow assurance systems for this system to do its, do its job. Um, in order to do this, there's a lengthy preparation for this connectivity. So the app provider with the flow assurance system takes a look, look at uh, drawings. So these are analog drawings on paper with the description of how the um, control system and process is set up, it's typical processes and instrumentation diagrams. They mark up the various information signals they like to receive and then send this to the EPC. The EPC uh, identifies the system data sources and further relays the request to, to uh, the suppliers. The supplier then identifies through data items, respond, return the data items to the EPC, and eventually the app provider gets the assembly of data. So the response is typically like this. Uh, and it, we can see already from the introductory text, there's a lot of uncertainty to the quality of the information coming back. There's, um, the sender of this email was uncertain about the status since uh, the request was sent before the vacation. Hence, we are talking about several weeks before we get the response. And then we look into the details of that Excel sheet. And then each line here is supposed to have one of those data items identified. But there's a lot of uh, challenges with the comments we see. So the comments says certain things like might be the right one, must be verified in the detailed con configuration of the SAS supplier. Hence, in order to assure that we have the right data point, we need to talk to the engineer that did the specific setup of the automation 
and, and get a confirmation that this is the data item we need. Other uh, varying comments does not exist or uh, two tags exist, which one is the right one, uh, etc. etc. So this lengthy procedure is done repeatedly times in a setup and a hookup of an application towards uh, an asset like the Ottoman loan. And this is what we call data plumbing. There's a lot of people involved, many iterations, etc. So this is very costly and there's no value by, um, uh, from the process by itself. So this type of challenges, hooking up data, goes for all the applications that need to hook into those data streams. And it's repeated across the enterprise for all the different assets. And all these are out. These are a combinatoric explosion of interoperability challenges. Now, what can be done with this? Uh, well, really, we, we need to cope with the challenges of interoperability. And really, where should we look to learn about someone that actually copes with or can manage and do interoperability in a very good way. Uh, my suggestion is that you look in the mirror. In the, in the mirror, you look at a human, and humans are fantastic at interoperability. Often I would do this presentation on stage, but now we're on, on a webinar, and still we have a good setup for interoperability on this webinar. You know the rules for posting questions, etc., and I will respond, and we do the sequence of presentation in order, etc. So there's there's quite a lot of of um, implicit uh, interoperability in the way we're doing this right now. Uh, and if you learn to play tennis, you can meet another tennis player you never met before, and the two of you can have a couple of hours perfect interoperability on the tennis court doing a match. The same thing goes for um, participants in traffic, participate in a very complex system with thousands of others. And even as a citizen in a city, you have interoperability in a very complex way with millions. So humans are really capable of very advanced interoperability. So how do we actually do this? What's, what's the underlying concept that enables us to interoperate in a way like this. Uh, I mean, this has a lot to do with, with how we process information and we do this through information models. So here's an example, a set of human entities. And then we have uh, a spectator to a football match. He's looking at those people. He's called Leopold. And in his mind, there's uh, the starts to build up a different a set of concepts. Some of these concepts are abstract, like a match and a team A and a team B. And we and have the idea that the teams, they participate in the match. And then you hook up the real uh, things that runs around on the court into this uh, these abstract concepts. And eventually, he has connected all he sees out there into the concept of the information structure and information model. So this idea and this concept uh, resides in Leopold's head. And from here, for him to have a good interaction and dialogue with his fellow spectator, uh, the same model must exist in uh, the heads of the fellow spectator. So this is the key enablement. Sharing information models is the key thing that makes us super efficient of interoperability in many perspectives. So the same real entities take place in different information models for us. We cannot say that any, one, any specific information model is the right one. There are different information models for different purposes. And the information models must be shared for them to work. 
if this one model only works for one person, doesn't give much sense. He cannot use it to communicate with others. So we humans, we have a lot of information model and abstract concepts, and we use this all the time in order to interoperate. And most of us also structure are really there just to create these shared uh, concepts of information models, like parenting, schooling, sports, etc. Uh, for the computers and machines that we use in our industrial applications, though, they don't know how to socialize, so we miss the system. So an alternative to doing the deep integration and data plumbing, we suggest is to go through an information model. So we go through for various types of purposes, we can identify information models that has been crafted by the industry or by standardization organizations, and that can be used to expose uh, the dynamic data from the assets. So we have one example for oil and gas with WITSAML. We have another one for standard maintenance model with open ONM, and a third one for enterprise resource planning with a ISA S95. These are all examples of information models available that can be used in order to facilitate such a standardization of information structures. Now, OPC UA. What's OPC UA? OPC UA is uh, a real time protocol that where you can host and put an information model inside, meaning you can provide data streams through a standardized information structure. And this makes the experience of plugging into such uh, an asset much more plug and play experience than if you have to do the deep integration towards uh, a different information structure on every asset. So OPC UA includes several communication protocols for different purposes. Uh, it has an information model standard. It's an open architecture and I, Fundamentally uh, important is that it has a security concept planned all the way from construction of the protocol. Um, facilitates collaboration through companion standards and is chosen by many of the other standardization bodies uh, like Industry 4.0, Namur and many others to be the, the fundamental technology underpinning the, uh, the, the data streams and reorganization of data streams into information structures. Other organization standardization groups now converts to use OPC UA. We have uh, examples like Open Group, like VDMA, Namur, I already mentioned, and the ISA. These are just a few of a lot of different activities that is now ongoing in trying to figure out and craft information models that can be channeled and used through the OPC UA protocol. There are numerous suppliers supporting this uh, almost everybody in automation and, and operational technology suppliers and there's a growing number of big end users going all in and embracing the technology so it's just uh, some a few example of the bigger ones and now in the next session we will hear a bit more from stefan on, on how Equinor looks upon this standard and the architectures in his organization. And then more questions. Let's see. Yeah, yeah. that's one more question. Uh, where do I find the information model I need? Do I get it from the OPC Foundation or where? Yeah, I guess that's uh, an important aspect and also a quite difficult question. Um, OPC Foundation, I would say, have, have crafted a set of elementary and basic information models. You will find some elementary one there, but um, I believe the, the other standardization uh, organizations, more specific to specific industries or specific to specific application domains, are the ones that will uh, create a lot of the more interesting information models. So a lot of those you will find here, but 
right now at the, at the current stage, it's quite difficult to try to figure out which one of all these initiatives that is ongoing now is the right for me and my company. Um, uh, also, the bigger companies that are using RPC UA now, like Equinor, uh, does have a challenge trying to figure out all of this. We know this because we need communication with them about this. I guess, uh, Stefan, you might have a comment to how to navigate and figure out uh, <laughs> where we can find the information about the relevant for, for your company. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is a challenge. Um, so, so the key, uh, the key for us is that uh, we, we cannot do this uh, alone. So, so uh, uh, Equinor is 100% uh, uh, depending on the the supply chain, the value chain, all the suppliers delivering software and hardware uh, to us. Uh, so, together with uh, with the industry, uh, we need to uh, figure this out um, uh, together and uh, and uh, and and make some some decisions on, on which uh, standards we shall use for which type of assets on which type of uh, use cases. Uh, there is a huge untapped uh, potential uh, there. So, so we need to understand what is out there today and what are the gaps and how can we together close those gaps. Great comments, Stefan. Thank you. I, uh, I believe there's some new, more questions here now, Robin, isn't it? Yes, there's one more. Uh, what is the big difference between a historian and OPC UA? Well, um, OPC UA is not, I would say, an in most settings, it's not an active application by itself. So OPC UA doesn't do very much things by itself. It's rather a specification, a definition of an API, if you would, would on how you can access information that will typically come from a historian. So a historian um, is, is, is the term used for a database storing a sensor data on, on, in time series, and you can pick up those time series through an API on that historian. And then OPC UA could provide you with uh, the API that is standardized across industries and across vendors to access the data from that historian in a standard way. Meaning that if you implement a, uh, an application that needs time series and you use OPC UA uh, historical data access, then you can access data from that application towards all historians that have implemented this specific API in, on, on their database. So you, by this you become independent of the historian supplier. You can choose another one for your next assets and you can still use the same application on top. 